Shad Adversity. Greetings, I'm Shad, and welcome back to Underappreciated Historical Weapons. And in this episode, as you've probably guessed by the title, we're going to be looking at the Sword Breaker. What a cool name, Sword Breaker. I mean, that's generally the name you would actually name some epic kind of legendary sword. Beware the Sword Breaker! But no, this is actually a historical weapon, but there is a bit of confusing things because technically th th there's two types of sword breakers from two different cultures. There is the European sword breaker, but there's also a Chinese weapon that is called, it's weird, why is it called the sword breaker? Because technically in Chinese it's called the Gan, Jan, get, I can't pronounce it. And I know there's like the Jian, but that's different to the Jian. Da, da. In Chinese, this is called a gan. I'm giving up. <laughs> so I'm gonna offer some speculation as to why they might consider it a sword breaker, because it's more a fancy kind of a club. But the interesting thing about this, the uh, strange application of the title sword breaker also actually kind of applies to when we look at the European version, because that doesn't necessarily break swords either. A European sword breaker is made to trap and lock away a sword, kind of breaking the opponent's ability to use it, hence kind of sword breaker. Now, could that logic be applied to the Chinese version? Maybe, we'll get to that. So I'll address the Chinese sword breaker a little bit later, but first let's dive into the more classical medieval sword breaker. And the first thing I should really say is that's it's not a medieval weapon, it's more, it's Renaissance. And so it seems like, well, maybe no one has had the exact idea of this type of sword breaker, the European one, earlier on in history, but that doesn't mean it couldn't be useful or effective in a medieval setting. And you can use it in fantasy fiction, stuff like that. In actual fact, it seems like it's hard to define exactly what type of sword breakers these are, but in the Wheel of Time series, so, so you see, that, see that series right there, one of my favorite fantasy series? There is a sword breaker in there. A character named Julen uses a sword breaker and is a thief catcher. It's basically some type of freelance cop, essentially. Or bounty hunter, one or the other. And he uses a sword breaker, which is clever to apply to this type of character because he wants to capture and immobilize the people, not kill them. Though you can stab with a sword, well, both sword breakers. <laughs> All right, Chinese one, it's gone. I'm not referring to it at all until I say I'm referring to it, okay? It's all European. <laughs> You're going to put that into the video, aren't you, Oz? What? No! He's my editor. <laughs> Alright, I can cut it out and post. See there. Okay, so this is a European sword breaker, and what an interesting weapon. Huh? We'll have a good close look at it, okay? Clearly, the thing that really catches your eye are these kind of tooth-like protrusions, like a comb running along. Now, in some versions of the sword breaker, they're just like you know, comb, you know, a tooth right? But in others, they have hooks or kind of spikes at the end to make it more difficult for when a sword, like, runs into this blade and then falls into one of these gaps, okay, that these hooks actually trap the sword in and it can't get out. It's interesting to try and figure out if this would only work with thin bladed weapons, and you can kind of see why it was developed in the Renaissance when the rapier was far more prominent. You see, a rapier is a one-handed weapon, so you've got a free hand. What are you going to use that free hand for? Well, rapiers were generally used in civilian duels. They were actually used on the battlefield a bit uh, as well, but okay, we'll look at the civilian self-defense dueling kind of thing like that. If you if you got this set up, you got a rapier, obviously in my opinion, so maybe it's not so obvious, but in my opinion a big shield would be great in, in almost everything. And when I say big, I mean I guess I love the Kai shield, of course, uh, but even a heater shield would still be really good. And buckler, Hmm, why would you not want to use a buckle with a rapier? Well, in terms of rapier style combat, you actually get a bit more leverage and ability to catch away opponents incoming strikes and stuff with a specific type of parrying dagger over a buckler. And so a parrying dagger can actually work better defensively than a buckler, which is designed for a defense. But then you have the added advantage that it's also a weapon. You can do some serious damage with this dagger. And so it can be argued, there are some people who dispute this, but it can be argued that a parrying dagger is better in defense, but and it's far better in offense. So even if you think it's not as good in defense than a buckler, because it has such offensive capacity, well, a dagger seems to be a favored companion for a rapier. And one of the reasons why daggers were better than just dual wielding rapiers is that it gets more maneuverability. If you're using two rapiers, there's a chance that their blades can actually get caught on one another. A smaller dagger gives you more maneuverability to move around this really long bladed weapon that you're using in your main hand. And so if the primary offhand weapon in this setting is a dagger, 
what's a way that we could improve this dagger, make it even better, make it a, so whatever a strike comes in, you could not only block, but you can trap their blade in such a way that you can manipulate it, push their blade completely away, ruin their defense, and just kill them. Well, this is where the logic comes in for the sword breaker. Like seriously, we can see people doing sparring matches and stuff where someone is using a sword breaker, and as soon as that rapier blade gets caught in, which seems very easy, you just need to face those tooth protrusions to the blade, hook it down, and then twist or angle it in such a way that the tooth, so pretending my hand is a tooth, the blade gets here, so the tooths get locked in, and through pressure and leverage, you can't pull the blade out. You've got full control of the duel now. It's like a pretty darn clever, but also dirty weapon because my goodness. And so if I lived in the past and I knew of the sword breaker, I would always be using a sword breaker over a regular dagger in every instance. And I wonder why they weren't more common. Maybe you guys might know, share some insight in the comments below. Love to hear them. Maybe they were very difficult to be made because I can't see how you could forge this shape. You would have to make a just a solid kind of big wide bladed knife and then grind those protrusions in. It would be a very fiddly difficult thing to make. So perhaps they weren't as prominent as the regular parrying dagger because they were really expensive. But for those who could afford it, my goodness, did they have an edge. And so I think that's a good point to remember if you're wanting to apply the, the sword breaker into a medieval fantasy setting, okay? These should not cost the same as a dagger or a parrying dagger. Just to, you know, a parrying dagger is a pretty cool weapon in of, of itself. The, the guard on a parrying dagger is much, much wider than a regular dagger, okay? It's specifically made to be used in conjunction with a rapier. So a parrying dagger is a specific type of thing. In actual fact, you see some parrying daggers that look very similar to a psi from Japan, you know, the martial arts side. Interesting conversion right there. But going back to what I was saying, if you're gonna be making the sword breaker available in a medieval setting, I think you need to remember that these would be far more expensive than a regular dagger, okay? So perhaps it's difficult to find it or a fewer more elite type of people use this type of weapon. But having said that, if you're in a setting where there's magical weapons, like a non-magical, the sword breaker wouldn't be more expensive than a magical sword, so maybe its availability would actually be far more common in a fantasy setting than it was historically. But still, I gotta say, this weapon certainly is an underappreciated one because there's also confusion about it. Like, what, what exactly is a sword breaker? And some people say you should call it a sword catcher. The sword breaker sounds so much cooler. I do have an interesting question about the sword breaker, and that is, would it be as effective against swords that have a wider blade? Because especially the ones that have kind of the hooks and pokes at the end of their comb kind of protrusions, those are very much made for a thin blade to get caught right in between those prongs, okay? And then it can't get out because of the hooks. But if the blade was much wider, to the point where only half the blade could fit inside the prongs of the sword breaker, well, there's far less chance of it being caught in this weapon. And in that sense, they might be completely useless. When I say completely useless, I'm talking about its sword catching mechanic might be useless. It could still be useless in stabbing and deflecting and stuff, but catching wider blades might be completely nullified. But having said that again, if you catch in a broader blade in between the prongs and then you twist it and really pull it to the side where there's a chance that the friction and leverage actually might lock that blade in place. And so, uh, we, I would need to see experimentation to see if this type of sword breaker could still be effective against wider blades and my logic is it could be possible but we would really need to see from experimentation. So guys, let me know if you've done it. Love to hear more. All right, so I've looked at the European one. What about the Chinese one? Because this, this is a bit weird. Isn't it? All, it's interesting. It's a very intriguing kind of weapon. In actual fact, if you were to try to make a comparison to the Chinese sword breaker, the nearest European comparison that I could make would be the Astok because the Chinese sword breaker has no edges, okay? They're, they're no sharpened edges. Uh, it's basically blunt, and oftentimes it's rectangular in cross-section or just square, or sometimes uh, the, the square edges, okay, the flats of the edges are pushed in a little bit, so it's a bit like a star cross-section, and so that just concentrates the force if you hit with the edge of it. But like I said, the edges aren't sharpened, so you're not gonna be coming through, but there's weight to it. In contrast to this, the stock is purely a thrusting weapon. I've never seen seen any people tr say that the stock was used to just bludgeon people and it doesn't look like the historical stocks had a lot of heft and weight in the blade where this Chinese sword breaker that does actually have a bit of heft and weight in the blade. There are reproductions made and stuff like that, where this is actually made to hurt people when you strike with the edge. You can thrust with it, it's got a pointy end, but it does seem like this is a more wacky weapon to really hurt people. Now, 
Why would this be considered a type of sword breaker? Well, Chinese swords seem to be quite thin and very flexible, depending on what period you're looking at and stuff like that. But even if you were to compare it to a non-flexible, pretty hefty sword, right? These Chinese sword breakers seem to be even heavier. They're shorter, so you get a decent amount of control, but still, they're, they're weighty, hefty things. And so if you have a sword coming at you, if you've got something heavier, you can whack that blade pretty hard and knock it aside, and there's a good chance you can actually damage it. And if you're being attacked with a very thin a lighter blade, well, interesting thing about this sword breaker is if they tried to block a, a hit from this hefty kind of steel rod, there's a chance that you will break that sword's guard because they're so flexible and it'll go through the sword and hit the opponent. And in that sense, it will break the opponent's sword. It might not snap it in two, but it could break their guard, knock it aside. And so perhaps that is why in translation it's considered a sword breaker. It's speculation. I actually don't know exactly. I would love to know because I haven't been able to find out, but I can kind of see why it's called a sword breaker in this sense. Very different to the European sword breaker, and it's a different kind of methodology. The advantages that the Chinese version seemed to get would be uh, matched, in my opinion, by, say, a European mace. Something heavy, something hefty, something that could just whack aside smaller kind of blades, but the mace is limited in reach in a big way, which is why swords usually outperform them. This, you know, Chinese one, doesn't seem like it would have as much heft as a mace, but it has more reach, so... You know, there's a lot of conclusions that we could probably come to through experimentation. I haven't been able to do that, but if you have and you have any insights, once again, I would love to hear them in the comments below. But here we go. This has been the Sword Breaker. Truly an underappreciated weapon. And look, in my opinion, I love the European one so much more. And I'm not saying that because I'm of European heritage and all that stupid comments where I got racist. Stupid. Shut up. No. I like the European one because it's more sophisticated, it's more versatile, and it can be employed in a weapon combination that has been shown to be devastating. This Chinese one looks to be a bit too heavy, a bit too clumsy. It's like, you know, a fancy kind of club, and, uh, you know, I can see benefits and weaknesses to it, but in my opinion, yeah, the actual European one is the true sword breaker. And there we go, this has been the sword breaker. A very underappreciated weapon, and uh, there are certain circumstances where it could be fit in really well to fantasy, role playing, and other things like that, and of course, just historical settings and stuff. I lost interest in the Musketeer TV show, the, you know, the more recent one made by the BBC, uh, so I didn't watch long enough to see any sword breakers there, but maybe they appear a bit later on. I'm just glad they were using parrying that and stuff in conjunction with their rapiers, and that the fact that there wasn't just rapiers, one of the characters actually use a broader kind of side sword weapon. But anyway, I'm getting distracted. Still, uh, other, you know, musketeer movies, I have not seen a sword breaker. We need more sword breakers. More sword breaker love people. They shouldn't outnumber parrying daggers if it's in a historical setting, but you can certainly employ them in fantasy and stuff like that, so have fun with them. And there we go. So this has been Sword Breaker. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you have enjoyed, and of course, I hope to see you again. So until that time, good luck.